Well, if you've got your Bibles with you, um, if you'd like to turn with me to Mark chapter 14, please, Mark chapter 14. And we'll just be reading from verses 53 uh, through to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Mark 14, verse 53 to the end of the chapter. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him, and to blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say to him, Prophesy! And the others struck him with the palms of their hands. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth? But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, I just pray, Father, that you'd help me this morning. Uh, Lord, as we look at your word, I pray that you'd penetrate our hearts pray you give me clarity of thought and speech, Lord, and bless this word to our souls for the glory of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. So last week we looked at the, um, we looked at the arrest of Christ in the garden uh, of Gethsemane, uh, the, the, the betrayer Judas coming uh, with the, uh, the garrison, with the, the, the band of men arresting Christ, and now they've taken him from the Mount of Olives down into the city, so they've gone westward, down into the kind of central northern part of the city to the high priest's residence, the high priest's house, which is where we pick up our text today. And I want to just talk about a trial this morning. We see Jesus on trial, or at least the initial stages of his trial. We know that uh, also the trial later involved Pilate, it involved Herod, but ultimately here we see him before Caiaphas, the high priest, and I want us to think, last week we looked at the, the strategies of, of uh, satanic uh, forces against the, the believers and ultimately those who uh, were involved with this uh, betrayal and this arrest and so on. But I want us to look at this trial this morning and consider two, two realities really. Firstly, it's a trial 
which brings ex exposure of the natural man. A trial which brings exposure of the natural man. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? The Christian faith really is one of, of great honesty. We have, a, we have the Word of God, which God speaks to us through His Word. It's really the only worldview in the whole world where we can look at ourselves in an honest fashion. We look at ourselves honestly in the mirror of God's Word. It exposes things about us, things that we've never seen before. Maybe we've been walking with the Lord for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it is, and we, and we find a verse in the morning one, one day, and it exposes something about us. It deals with us. That's what the Christian faith, what God does in the mirror, as we look in the mirror of His Word. So we see a trial here that exposes something about the natural man's condition. Now bear in mind it's the natural man's condition. We know that when a person is born again, that there's changes in their life uh, that occur. But we're considering here the natural man's condition. And then secondly, a trial which brings great comfort to Christ's people. A trial which brings great comfort to Christ's people. And that's a bit of a smaller point towards the end of the message today. Firstly, within this trial, we see a trial that exposes the sin of natural man's hostility towards God. It exposes the natural man's hostility towards God. And we've already discussed last week about how early on in the ministry of Christ they sought the Pharisees, they sought how they might destroy him, they sought with the Herodians how they might destroy him. They were waiting for that right opportunity. They now had Judas, this insider, who would be part of this betrayal. They had their chance. They arrested him and they took him away like a lamb being led to the slaughter. Now initially, we don't see it in Mark, but in John it tells us uh, that Jesus was taken to a, a man called Annas. He was, the, he was the high priest for a long period of time, and Caiaphas was Annas' uh, uh, um, son-in-law. He was his son-in-law, so Annas was originally the high priest, and then there was uh, Josephus, the historian, records how there was uh, later, I think it was five of his children that became high priests in succession to him. And Caiaphas, now his son-in-law, was the high priest. But sometimes also Annas was called the high priest. So if you read the account in John, you'll hear how he was taken to the high priest, but they were referring there to Annas. And they all lived in the same kind of accommodation. They lived in the high priest's quarters. So... In John, I'll just read this, just, just really in re reference to our, fir our first point, really. But we see Annas in John 18, verse 24, he sent Jesus bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. He questioned him. He questioned, it says that he questioned his doctrine. And then he sent him away bound uh, to, to Caiaphas, his son-in-law. Again, like a lamb being led to the slaughter. It shows this picture here of one who wanted nothing really to do with this Christ, this man who stood before them. Away with him from my sight. Pass him on to the high priest. Let's get this process started. Let's get this ball rolling. Do you remember what Jesus said to, to Pilate? He said, the one that handed me to you has the greatest sin. And we see Annas here, this kind of chief. He's, he's almost like a background figure. He's like someone who's he's no longer the official high priest, but he's the man in the shadows, the man who, the, the, the elder uh, ex-high priest who calls the shots. So he basically sends Christ away to Caiaphas to be seen by, Christ, by Caiaphas. We see really a picture here of man's hostility towards God, not wanting to not wanting to um, retain the knowledge of God in their own lives. It says that, doesn't it, in Romans 1, 28. And these, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. And man in, in their natural condition wants very little to do with God. They want to, they want to get away from him. They want to get him out of their minds. They want to, that, that it's the only way that, that, they're, that they have that peace in, re, in regards to getting on with their sinful ways, if I could put it like that, or that pleasure not true peace, of course, but that pleasure that is in sin for a season, as the Bible tells us, is to push God out of the way, to push God out of your mind. And that's really what Anas was doing here. So just a short point before we, we go into our first section here today. He sent him away to Caiaphas. He says, take him away, get him, let him be bound and led away to Caiaphas, the high priest, which is where Mark really picks it up from today in verse 53. What we see, first of all, really, the exposing of na man's natural accusing heart, the, the natural man's accusing heart. 
He's taken to Caiaphas, the same house with a courtyard where Peter was warming himself, so Peter's gone in. There's some kind of courtyard there. There's some kind of upper room where this trial's taking place. We don't quite know exactly how that would have looked necessarily. But they were in close proximity. We know there was eye contact between Jesus and Peter later on in the, uh, in the account, uh, in the synoptic Gospels. And then we see Caiaphas beginning to level these accusations towards the feet of Christ. We see in our text today, verses 61 to 64, and the high priest, that's Caiaphas, stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And we know about Christ's response. We'll look at that in just a moment. We see here allegations. We see here accusations being brought to Christ. Yes, there was a line of questioning in some way. Are you the Son of the Blessed? Are you the Christ? Do you answer nothing? But ultimately these questions were meant to be a, a trap to Christ. They were meant as entrapment towards him. Accusing God. Accusing the God-man who stood before them. The one who did no wrong. The one who thought no wrong, spoke no wrong, ever did any wrong. No sin in his life. But yet finding accusation against this man. Accusing this man. Don't we see that in the world around us today? We see men and women accusing God for all kinds of things. Why does God allow this? If there's a God, why does he do this? Why does he do that? If there's a God, why does he allow a tsunami to kill 10,000 people? Where was he the other day when this child died or where this tragedy happened, where this took place? Why would God let that, ha that happen? I think if I had like five pounds for every time I heard someone start the question, if there was a God, then why fill in the blank? Why allow suffering? Why this? Why that? I'd be, I'd be very rich. It's interesting, isn't it? Questioning God, accusing God. How can God let this take place? Why does God let this happen? It reminds me a little bit of Job. Remember all the tribulation that Job went through and he brought his questions to God and God responded to him, didn't he, in, in Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job. This was God's answer to Job's question. Out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you. And you shall answer me, says God. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? And then it goes on in Job. Have you entered the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? Or loose the belt of Orion? You see, God... Notice here God doesn't respond to Job's question, but he begins to respond showing him that he's the creator. He begins to speak about who he is in the whole situation. He doesn't come down and answer Job in, re in relation to his present needs, but he begins to show Job who he is. He's the one who holds the belt of Orion. He's the one who measures the breadth of the, of the earth and the sea and the skies. He's the one who put the stars in space and knows them all by name. He brings the question back to Job. It's interesting, isn't it? Often, that's the issue really when you think about man's accusations against God. They've got questions for God. If I saw God, I want to ask him this. I want to tell him this. The problem is they don't know the God that they're speaking of. The questions and the allegations and the accusations they're bringing against God, they need to sit and they need to ponder upon this one who is eternal in his very being, or in the essence of his very nature. Accusations, being an accuser, it has a root. We spoke the other day, last week, about spiritual um, uh, strategies. But we know that Satan, Revelation 12, says that he's an accuser. I heard a loud voice, Revelation 12, 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God, of our God and the authority of Christ have come 
for the accuser of our brothers, sometimes he's known as the accuser of the brethren, has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. So we see here in this text of Revelation, we see Satan accusing the brethren, accusing Christians, accusing the people of God. And we see in our text of the trial today in Mark 12, we see this satanic accusation that's been God using men, as we spoke about last week, to accuse Christ, to come at him with accusations. He's the accuser, accuser not only of Christ in our text today, but the accuser of the brethren. He's always accusing us before God. He's, he's, the, he's the whisper in the ear. You're not good enough. You call yourself a Christian? If only they knew what you did last week. If only they knew that conversation that you've had at work the other day. The way you acted towards that person. Those thoughts that you had. Those wicked evil things you've been thinking in your mind last week. If everybody knew about you, it would be shameful. You call yourself a Christian. These are the accusations Satan is sowing into the minds of God's people. When you hear those accusations, you know, you can take, you can take comfort. Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. We've been saved brothers and sisters in Christ, by the grace of God, through the work of Christ upon the cross. If he has counted us innocent, justified in his sight, because of the blood that was shed, then you don't have to listen to the accusations of the enemy that will, tend, that will, that will sow doubt and seeds of fear into your minds. Seeds of guilt, condemnation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes he bring, the enemy uses people, as he's doing here, to accuse Christ. He uses people in our own lives to, to bring accusations to us. It may be when we're doing something right, when we're obeying. We're starting to get serious about our faith. We're starting to take the scriptures seriously. We're starting to obey the Lord of glory. And you hear the voices, ah, oh, look at him. He's becoming a legalist. He thinks he's better than the rest of us. He's holier than now. He won't come out drinking. He won't come out doing drugs. He won't enter into this conversation. Look at him. Who does he think he is? You need to chill out. You're getting too serious with this religious business. You think you're better than everyone else. Trying to be holy. Accusations. Accusations accusations and maybe or maybe let's flip it around maybe the maybe we're the one who's accusing others maybe we're the one who has the issue with accusing those around us it's everybody else's fault i know I, yeah i may have been involved but it's their fault they're the ones that have done this they're the ones that need to repent they're the ones that need to don't, don't you know the bible says this they should look at this in the bible it says it here they're the ones who need to change. Always pointing the finger at someone else. Remember that with Adam and Eve. Oh, the woman gave it me. And then to Eve, oh, the serpent gave it me. Always passing the blame onto the next person. Not realising that actually we're the ones that need to change. In fact, if you're someone, I mean, I hope this isn't the case for any of us in here today, but, you know, with people who are always... Always, there's always a problem everywhere they go. Oh, it's so and so is the problem, so and so is the problem. You know, it comes to a point where we have to ask ourselves serious questions about what involvement do we have in those situations. If we have a problem everywhere we go, we need to ask ourselves a serious question. But what, in, what part are we playing in those problems? We need to realise it's not everybody else around us necessarily. But often and more often than not, maybe it's us. And also we need to realise, you know, that love covers a multitude of sins. We haven't always got to pull people up every time. We haven't always got to accuse. We may even be in the right. It may even be that we've been wronged. But there's times where we can just give it to the Lord. We hand it over and say, Lord, it's, the, the, battle, the battle is yours. Not to respond in an accusatory manner. 
So we see accusations being leveled at the feet of Christ in our text today. And then after, this, after the accusations, we see, we see to some degree insults, mockery, and more than that, physical violence even taking place, really showing the disdain that man has for God. And I've heard a preacher say this once, and I've, pre I've, I've preached it before myself probably more than one occasion. But you know, the hatred that man in his natural condition has towards God is so great, it's so to such a degree that if man could, they would actually kill God. And you say, that's a bit extreme. How, do, how can you say that? And I can say it because man did kill God. They killed Christ. They crucified him. It says in verse 65 of our text, then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. So they've put this blindfold on, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands, spitting in the face of their creator. Think about that. The creator, the God-man who created all things, all things were made by him, through him and for him, spitting in his face. You know, spitting, spitting in someone's face, or having someone spit in our faces, is a very grotesque way of disrespecting someone. It's a very grotesque and vile thing to have take place. But they were doing this to show their agreement with the high priest, the San, often to show their agreement with a situation the Sanhedrin, that's this collective group of leaders, this council of 70 leaders made up of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, uh, they collectively condemned Christ. And some of them expressed this hostility towards him by, by spitting at him, spitting in his face, to indicate, indicate his exclusion from the group. The one who upholds this world by the word of his power, the one who is on the throne of heaven, as Nick was praying earlier, the one who is seating seated at the right hand of the Father, came, left the glories of heaven, and mere man with feet that have been made from dust of the earth, man that's been made by this one who stood before them, was spitting in his face to express disgust. They blindfolded him. They said, prophesy, prophesy. So here is this one, the light of the world, and he's blindfolded, he's in physical, physical darkness. They're mocking him prophesy to us here is this one who said in the beginning let there be light and the universe came into existence this one who's the light of the world that shines upon the hearts of men the light who came into the darkness now being blindfolded by men and mocked and scoffed at beaten and struck struck him with the palms of their hands verse 65 and we know from the garden just a few moments earlier a few hours prior when they said are you Jesus he said I am and they all fell to the ground do you remember what he said in the synoptics do you not realize I could call 12 legions of angels now 12 legions of angels to destroy every single one of us every single one of you who do you think it was that flooded the world and killed every single human being on the face of planet Earth bar eight people. Christ was fully involved with that. Or what about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, when he attempted to mock God, he wanted to take the city of Jerusalem. And the angel of the Lord came and destroyed 185,000 Assyrians overnight. They woke up in the morning in the camp, 185,000 men dead. That was Christ. It says an angel of the Lord, but there some believe that was Christ. At least someone, one of the angels working on behalf of Christ. We see a glimpse of the power of God, the power of Christ throughout the whole of the scriptures. A glimpse of his power as those, that band, of, that garrison who came to arrest him fell to the ground. And here he is, standing resolutely as they slap his face, as they mock him and they scoff him. We see man in their natural condition, at enmity with God, accusing God, wanting him gone. So we see a trial. We see a trial that exposes man's natural accusations, man's natural hostility. But also we see a trial that, expose, that exposes man's natural deceitful heart, exposes the natural man's deceitful heart. We've seen the deceitfulness of Judas. 
as he betrays Christ. Now let's consider the trial for a minute. There are some that think that this trial was illegal, that it took place in an, in an illegal way. Often with a trial of this nature, they would meet around the temple in the market area. It would be, um, it would be a, a, a daytime affair. Meeting in the night at the high priest's residence was quite unusual. There are some Jewish historians that uh, have mentioned, now albeit that, they were, that these historians wrote, recorded this after the, uh, uh, the, 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 the trial of Christ, but they recorded that um, an assembly that would meet in this way was unusual. It could have been illegal. We don't know for sure. More than likely it was. Right from the beginning of this trial, there was, there was prejudice, there was bias towards Christ. It says that they, that they sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but none was found. Verse 55. So they were looking to get people to come in one by one and to testify against Christ in order that they, would, that they could put him to death. It's interesting, isn't it, that they had these, test of t these people coming in to testify. It says, but none could be found. Doesn't that show the purity of Christ, the goodness of Christ? Even he had three, three years plus ministry and they could have tried to pin anything on him, but they couldn't find anything. They couldn't find anything. That's, a, that's an amazing... Um, it, it, it's just amazing to consider the purity of our Lord and his goodness. It says in verse 56, For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies didn't agree. So in some ways, at least in this trial, they were at least seemingly trying to adhere to, in some part to the principles of Jewish judicial law. We see principles in Deuteronomy 19, uh, verse 15, about one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So Deuteronomy, there was these judicial laws that were put in place all the way back from Moses' time where no one could come on with just one piece of evidence. There needed to be two or more witnesses that would gather and it would be a credible, uh, reliable account of what took place between these two witnesses. And this wasn't taking place. They were confusing. The testimonies were confusing. One person would come and say one thing. One person would come and say something contradictory, perhaps. That at least in some ways, they were adhering to the Mosaic and the judicial law of the Old Testament. In fact, it was, very, it was actually a very serious thing in the Old Testament if someone came with, false, uh, with a false testimony, false witness testimony, because that individual, if found to be uh, lying, if it was found to be untrue, would be treated with the same penalty than the one who was actually on trial. So it was very serious. We even see those, uh, that principle of two or more witnesses was carried on into the New Testament, it's carried on into the church. Uh, for example, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul says, This will be the third time I'm coming to you by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word shall be established. 1 Timothy 5.19 concerning church governance. It says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. And we even have that in our legal systems today. Here we are thousands of years on. The British court system, often you need more than one person just coming and giving one witness account. There needs to be credible witnesses in a trial. And that's what we see taking place here. But what were these accusations that they were making against him? Well, verses 57 to 58, it says that they, some rose up and they bore false witness against him, saying, we heard him say, we heard this Jesus say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days, I will build another made without hands. But not even their testimony is agreed. Does that sound familiar to you? At this point, we may be thinking, that's interesting. I, I, remember, that in the, I remember that earlier on in the Gospels. I remember Christ talking about a temple being thrown down. Well, just a few days earlier, we know the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus said, you see this building, not one brick will be left upon another. But is there anywhere else? Anywhere else we can think of? Well, remember when Jesus cleansed the temple? There was two cleans that Most people believe that there was two cleansings of the temple. There's the one that we read about not long ago as he comes into the, the city of Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, and he cleanses the temple. But right back at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see in John chapter 2, 
Jesus also cleansing the temple. That he makes a whip and he drives out the money lenders. You remember he says, this is my father's house and you've made it into a house of merchandise. And in John 2.18, the Jews answered him and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered, to, answered them and said, destroy this. So he's talking to them and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And do you remember what he was talking about? What was he talking about? Which temple was he referring to? The, the temple of his body, right? And he was actually saying to them, he was saying, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And these witness testimonies, now here we are three years on, they're saying, yeah, this guy said he's going to destroy the temple, he's going to build another temple made without hands. It's interesting because in the very allegations that they're making against him, what's taking place is that actual prophecy three years earlier concerning the temple that's going to get destroyed and be raised up again in three days. And here we are almost three days away from that temple being raised up, the temple of his body. The temple of his body. These accusations that they were levelling at the feet of Christ, they were completely bogus and false. They had no basis in reality. And in some ways, the high priest of the Sanhedrin, this Caiaphas, in some ways he knew that. He knew that. It's interesting, wasn't it? His, it says that Jesus' initial response, his initial response to these allegations, to these, these um, accusations being brought against him was one of silence. He didn't respond. Proverbs 26.4 says, don't, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Christ stood there and he kept his mouth closed at this point in time. So then Caiaphas steps in. He tries, to, to, he tries to change things up. The witness testimonies aren't working. They're not matching up. They're not, not going to give us what we need to pin something on this man. So Caiaphas steps up. He changes his tactics. He introduces a, an ensnarement, a, dece, an, a, a deception. He asks Christ the question outright, verse 61. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus responded this time. He said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. There's two aspects to this question. Are you the Christ? Are you the Christ, this long-awaited Messiah? This one that the Old Testament prophesies of? And secondly, are you the Son of the Blessed? It's another way of really saying the Son of God. They wouldn't use the name of God. They wouldn't speak it out from their lips because of reverence. But they use this title, the Son, the Son of the Blessed One. Now we as New Testament believers, we understand with regards to the Son of God, we, we understand as, as the, uh, as Him as the second person of the Trinity. We understand the reality of His divine nature, that God became incarnate, that God took on flesh. However, the viewpoint in, uh, of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the high priest at this point, was that the Messiah would be one who, who was to come as a descendant from the throne of David. Yes, having been endowed with divine authority from on high and empowered from God, but actually they didn't recognise that the Messiah would be divine in, in very nature, in the very essence uh, of his being, that he would in essence be God himself. And they asked him this question, really it was rhetorical. They weren't trying to find out the answer but they were effectively trying to get something to charge him with. When, Caiapha, when Caiaphas said, tell us the truth, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? They weren't trying to find out the answer. They just wanted to charge him. And he responded that he was. Tearing their clothes in anger at his response. They must have been thinking, this is what we needed. Here is this one. Jesus openly claiming divine authority given, it, given from above, recognising himself as the son of the blessed one, the Messiah. What more evidence do we need? It's a straightforward blasphemy case, blasphemy charges against this man, punishable by death. Everything we've suspected all along and everything that we've needed in order to destroy this troublemaker, Jesus. It's now been made clear. He will now meet his demise and this will all be over, dealt with very quickly, all finished and gone from our sight. And that would have been the case. 
All that would have been true. That is, unless, of course, one thing. Unless what Christ had stated in his reply to them was true, which it is. That he is the Christ. That he is the Son of God. You see, these men were making lies. They were fabricating lies and rooting themselves in deceit because they didn't want to believe the truth. They didn't want to believe his response. When he said to them, I am and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. They didn't want that to be true. They didn't want him to be the Messiah. They had a preconceived idea and understanding about this one who stood before them. And really that's the problem, in, in essence, really with mankind in general. Mankind doesn't want Christ to be the one who can save them. Mankind doesn't, in their very natural condition, they don't want God to rule over them. So they have a preconditioned idea, that, or what's known as a presupposition, they have a pre-belief, and they interpret everything in the world around them through these lenses where they don't want to see. They don't want to see that which is true. Have any of you ever seen the film The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel? Have you ever seen that? It's a good film, actually. I'd recommend it just in regards to its, its kind of cinematic uh, um, perspective, but it's a good film. And, and there's a part in that film, you've got Lee Strobel, he's, he's a, a kind of um, a journalist, and he uh, deals with crimes and stuff. And one of his articles, some of the things he did in his job actually ended up uh, putting someone in prison. A man went to prison, and there was an innocent man who was found guilty, but because the man was an informant for the police, um, he, he basically had to go along with his sentence. He ended up in prison. Then they found out, the man in prison was found out to be an informant, so he was beaten up really badly. Uh, he was critical in hospital. And then Lee Strobel, this journalist, finds out the man was innocent, and he's actually caused this to happen. And he goes to visit this man in his hospital bed. And Lee Strobel's speaking with him. And I might, I might apologise if I forget this a little bit wrong, but he, he says something to the man like, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see. I didn't see it. I didn't see because I was too blinded by, what, by the case and what I was trying to, uh, um, the inquiry that I was trying to make. He said, I didn't see. And the man turned around and said something like, you didn't see because you didn't want to see. You didn't see because you didn't want to see. And that's like mankind. Mankind won't see because they don't want to see. These, the, the Caiaphas and the high priest here and the, and the, the Sanhedrin, they didn't see Christ, this one stood before them because they didn't want to see. Men, by their very nature, don't want to see. We deceive ourselves. You see, deception is really the only other option to truth. You either believe it to be true or you follow a lie. There's either God or lies. God is truth. Everything that comes from him is truth. You either trust him or you go your own way and you live in a deception. The Bible says in Romans 3, let God be true and every man a liar. And lying, in essence, deception, in essence, at its root, is to reject God. It's to exchange, remember in Romans chapter 1, it speaks about exchanging the truth of God. Those who are handed over under the judgment of God, they exchange the truth of God for a lie and they worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator. And mankind does that all over the world today. They exchange the truth that can be known about God. They exchange it for lies. Not being honest with themselves, not being honest with those around them, and ultimately not being honest with God. You see, sin is a lie. lie it's not just that we, we sin when we lie, but all sin is a lie concerning the character of God that we've been made in. God calls us as image bearers to reflect his character, to live in, in accordance with his will and with his truth. And when we go our own way, we effectively lie about who he is. We lie about the very character of God himself. So it exposes a deception that lies within all men. This trial also exposes the weakness of the natural man. Weakness of the natural man. Do you remember last week we, we looked at how the men in the garden were running scared and Peter had lopped off the ear of Malchus and now he's running for his life. But actually, he didn't run too far. And we don't actually know how this happened, uh, how he followed them, but we know that he followed them. Verse 54 speaks of how he followed 
Christ at a distance, probably far enough away just so he wasn't going to get arrested himself. And he went into the city, went into Caiaphas' house. Now he got in there through another disciple who was known uh, to the high priest. Now, the other disciple may have been John himself, but we don't know for sure. But Peter was in the high priest's courtyard. He can somehow see this trial taking place. Again, we don't know whether it was up on, another, on a mezzanine level, whether it was inside a room. These, tr- these witnesses were being called in one by one to give credible accounts. That wasn't happening. Now they've leveled accusations. Peter's there warming himself by a fire. I wonder what he's thinking. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to, to, this, to this Christ, this one not who I said I was going to die with? I'd be prepared to die with. What's going to happen to him? What's going to happen now to each one of us? Now it's interesting, in Mark's account, it kind of bookends, you can see here the bookends of verse, uh, verse 53 and 54, it starts with Peter, and then it ends with Peter, verses 66 to 72, and right in the middle of that is the account of Jesus. Now Mark does that for a reason, he's trying to contrast the failing weakness of this disciple, who's denying his Lord, and the steadfast, resolute, bold, fearless Christ and Lord of glory who's standing there as they're beating and mocking and, and, and accusing him, standing there resolutely and, and, and powerfully amongst his accusers. So Mark brings this contrast in. He shows Peter warming himself by the fire with, his, uh, with the servants of the high priest. We see in verse 67 of our account of Peter here, the the first servant girl steps up. You were with Jesus of Nazareth. He denies it. The first denial. The cockerel crows. He probably probably doesn't clock it at this point. It's a a noise in the background. There's a cockerel, cockerel crowing. He probably is so bamboozled by what's going on that he just lets it slide. He doesn't notice it at this point. He, de- he denied the Lord. He shrunk back into the shadows, showing his weakness. It says he moved out onto the porchway, maybe away from the warmth of the fire. He, he realises they're onto me. I need to start stepping back. I need to start stepping away. I wonder what would have been the outcome if there's... You, you're one of those that were, that were with him also. I wonder what it would have been if he stood up and said, yeah, I, I was with him. So what, what of it? What... What are you going to do? What about it? Now we know that that wasn't going to happen. We know that God is true and every man is a liar. And Peter shrunk and, and failed the first test, denying his Lord. Perhaps becoming more fearful. He's made that first denial. Maybe fear was setting in. He realises there's those in the courtyard that are beginning to recognise him. The narrative moves on. The girl begins to tell others. Verse 69 this is one of them. He denies their claim a second time. Maybe it was a bit easier the second time. You know the second time when you're going, if you ever, I don't know if you've ever had that, you're going down a path of sin like this, something happens. It was maybe a bit easier for him the second time to just to make that denial as he goes through. I wasn't, I'm not one of them. I'm not, one of, I'm, not, I'm not with him. And then we see there were those the third time those next to him, recognising him as a Galilean. His speech gave him away. I mean, how does a common fisherman from Galilee end up in the, in the courtyard of the high priest of Jerusalem in the freezing cold evening whilst Jesus the Nazarene is on trial? Peter would have stuck out like a sore thumb. It's like, a, imagine like a, a Geordie fisherman down in, L- in, L- in London and he's in the, the Houses of Parliament, he's with the, the dignitaries, he's with the, the social elite, the religious, you know, he's with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the religious leaders of the day and he's there just trying to keep himself away in the corner. It says that his speech gave him away. There was a different accent. There was something about, there was often prejudice that would have took place between those who were based in Jerusalem and those outside uh, up in the Galilean regions. Not only that, on this third account, he began to curse and to swear. That's interesting, isn't it? The disciple here, cursing and swearing. I don't know this man who you speak of. By this point, Peter had lost, he'd lost all inhibitions. Seemingly, 
completely succumb to the fear of man, denying his Lord for the third time. And then just then, just then, as soon as he, it says while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed a second time. There's no doubt that Peter would have heard that rooster crowing loud and clear at this point. In fact, in Luke chapter 22 in the synoptics, it tells us that as the rooster was crowing, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So they could have seen, they could have seen one another from where they were. And then it says, Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and, wi- uh, and wept bitterly. We see the natural weakness of man and how we fall into sin so easily. Each time the sin growing easier and easier to do, first time, second time, third time, first denial, second time, third denial. Have you ever, have you ever experienced that? Maybe you go to work and there's a conversation that you know you shouldn't really be getting involved with. Conversation with colleagues in the office. You know you shouldn't be getting involved with that conversation, but you start to get involved. You come away, you feel... You feel bad about it, but then you go back to work in the afternoon, the conversation's carrying on, it gets easier, and that's how sin takes a hold of people. It starts to desensitize you. You start to step into it, and it drags you away. It's like a river as you're entering into a river, and the pull of the current starts to take you. The more and more you go into that current, the easier it is to get swept away. That's how sin works. It's like a trap. It's a slow process. And what's the encounter, what's the remedy? What's the remedy for that kind of fear, that kind of sin in our lives where we get taken away into these things? Well, ultimately, it's an encounter with the living God. We see here Peter, one who's weeping and broken, just a few short days later, being reinstated with, by the Lord, being reconciled with Christ, humbly acknowledging his guilt before God and coming to this one whose love endures forever. Recognizing that the love of God is unconditional, that, that although we fail, although we mess up time after time, although we, we, we fall into sin in various ways, we have a Savior who's willing to receive us back to Himself. He's willing to forgive, He's willing to reinstate. He, not only did He reinstate and forgive this one, but He, he, he made Him a a, 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 a feeder of his sheep. He said, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Look after my lambs. He was instrumental in the apostolic foundation of the church. This one who, who denied Christ in such a fearful way was, was made bold in the power of the Spirit. He was broken over his sin because he realized that Christ was the one who was broken for his sin. That's the way, if you want to be broken over, if you want to change, if you want to put to death your, the sin in your life, you need to look to the cross. Look to the price that was paid. Peter wept bitterly knowing the, the, what, this, what this Lord and teacher that he'd been following for three or more years was going through, what he was about to go through. And we can know that our weakness can be used powerfully for God as God works in us by his spirit. Now finally now, we've looked at a trial that brings exposure, exposes the natural man, but it's a trial that brings great comfort. A trial that brings great comfort. Now to Christ, it brought great suffering. It brought, it brought great pain. We read it in the start of our service this morning, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. He went through pain unimaginable, not only in the physical realm, but the spiritual reality of God the Father's wrath being poured out, that eternal cup of wrath being poured out upon Christ in in the place of sinners like us. But he went through that for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising its shame, Hebrews chapter 12. But you know, it's a trial within which we can take great comfort. We can take great comfort in the promises of God being fulfilled. We see all the promises of the Old Testament, of the coming of the Christ, the one who's going to make all things new, the one who's going to crush the serpent's head at Calvary, 
the one who's going to set captivity captive and give gifts to men, redeeming a people unto himself for his great and mighty name and for his own glory. And what we're seeing here at the commencement of this trial, we're seeing the culmination of many of these prophecies in the Old Testament coming together. We see this one, as we read earlier, uh, that Isaiah speaks of, who was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. It's interesting, isn't it? This lamb who was bound and led to the priest, led to the high priest. And you see a picture there, the Old Testament, the priest taking the sacrifice and making that sacrifice for the atonements of the people. You see that here in our picture today in this trial. He was wounded, Isaiah 53, 5, wounded for our transgressions. By whose stripes we are healed, he was despised and rejected by men. We see the culmination of these prophecies taking place within this trial. And then we go on to the crucifixion. We see more prophetic fulfillment. A few hours later, do you know what, what did Jesus does anyone remember what Jesus cried out on the cross? Well, he cried out several things. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know where he's quoting from there? Anyone, anyone remember? When he's, when he's crying that out on the cross, he's quoting from Psalm 22. He's quoting from Psalm 22. And that was like a Jewish hymn book. It's like we have our Christian hymns today, we have our hymnals, we have our favourites. They had the book of Psalms. It was like their hymn books. These leaders would have known these hymns. Jesus is beginning to quote Psalm 22 as he's hanging upon a cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like, it's like I don't want to be too irreverent here. It's like the equivalent of, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know, we, I mean, obviously that's not inspired text, but Jesus is, is quoting the inspired word of God. And these people should have known this hymn. They should have known this word. If only they would have kept reading as he's hanging upon the cross and all the things that are taking place around him as that's happening. We go through, we go through Psalm 22. Despised by the people, all those who see me, they ridicule me. They shoot out their lip, they shake their head saying, he trusted the Lord, let him rescue him. Does that sound familiar? This is what they were saying as he's being crucified. For dogs have surrounded me, uh, uh, Psalm 22. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This is hundreds and hundreds of years before the crucifixion. They pierced my hands and my, and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my, lo my clothing they cast lots. The soldiers were doing that at the, feet of the, at the foot of the cross whilst Jesus was there quoting Psalm 22. If these religious leaders would have only kept reading, only kept thinking about the rest of Psalm 22 as this one is hanging between heaven and earth, atoning for his people. Do you know when they blindfolded Jesus and they were mocking him and they said, prophesy to us, prophesy to us. Do you know what was happening at that point? Prophecy was taking place at that point. Prophecy was taking place. As I've already mentioned, he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. That was taking place. The very allegations that they were claiming towards him were coming, were coming true right before their eyes and they didn't even see it. If they only knew their Old Testament, places like Isaiah 50 verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Prophecies being fulfilled in this trial. They completely missed it. These religious leaders, these Pharisees, these hypocrites, they missed the one who was come and fulfilling this prophecy. He wasn't just giving them prophecy, they were involved in fulfilling the prophecies. And then we look outside into the courtyard as dawn was fast approaching. We see, we see Peter Fulfilling the prophecies of the previous evening, you'll deny me three times, that he would deny Christ, the cock crows twice. And just as it happened, just as it happened exactly as Christ foretold, foretold it to happen and said that it would, Jesus made eye contact with Peter. 
I would imagine, you know, when Peter went out and wept, I would imagine he wasn't just weeping because of the fact that he denied Christ. But he was probably weeping because he saw the reality of that prophecy coming true. He saw the reality of what Christ, what Christ had said to him on the previous evening coming true. He saw the reality that here was the Lord who never failed. Here was the Lord who was the truth personified, the way, the truth, and the life. And now just to end, we can take comfort in the promises of God, the prophecies of God being fulfilled, and we can take comfort in the person of Christ. They asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And he responded, I am, and you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now many people like to debate about what what Christ was talking about here. When does that take place? Was that 70 AD? Or was that a future context? Or was it both? Was there a duplicity in this prophecy? But really, we don't want to miss the point here of Christ quoting from Daniel 7 concerning this one. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought, they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion. This is to Christ. To Christ was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. What do we see here? This one who stands on trial. We see a king. Do you remember what he said to Pilate? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. He's not like a mere, like an earthly king. He wasn't coming just to defeat the powers of Rome, but he came to defeat the powers of sin, the powers of hell and the grave. This king of all kings, this lord of all lords, this one who came just a few short hours later, hung between heaven and earth, giving his life and, and making his soul, having his soul made an offering for sin in the place of his people. Rising from the dead, being brought near to the Ancient of Days, ascending to the right hand of the Father, and being given all dominion and glory and honour and praise. We can take great comfort. This wasn't just some ruthless criminal that was on, 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 uh, on trial here that got crucified and they threw his body in a grave and that's the end of it. But we see here these prophecies being fulfilled and we see here this risen Saviour Rising, to the again, uh, rising from the dead, rising again. We see another prophecy being fulfilled in the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord. So just some thoughts for us there from the text today. You know, we considered the plight of natural man, the accusing nature of man, the deceived nature of man, the weakness of man. And when we get saved, we know that the Lord changes us, puts his spirit within us. He empowers us to be bold, as he did with Peter on the day of Pentecost. He filled him with his spirit. You know, Peter, uh, Christian tradition would state that he was killed for his faith. He went to his own death. So eventually he did die for the Lord and with the Lord in that sense. But you know, we can be a people who know the boldness of the, of the power of God on our lives. We don't have to succumb to the sins of this world. May we be a people that aren't accusing one another Maybe you have accusations from the enemy himself. Take that, take that to the Lord. Take those verses. Meditate upon those verses about the, 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 the forgiveness that is found in Christ. And may we be a people that have great comfort that Christ came exactly as he said he was going to. And he accomplished that exactly which he said he was going to. And that we have this King of glory on heaven who forever intercedes for his people. Amen.